Sue, would you like to say a few words? Um, everybody, uh, welcome uh, to this auspicious meeting on redistricting, gerrymandering, and voting rights. Uh, very appropriately, it's on National Voter Registration Day, uh, which was not something we had originally planned, but it worked out nicely. Um, and um, we have a lot to learn with uh, details. Um, everybody, if you can share your uh, video of your picture, that makes it more alive as far as the discussion. And um, Connie and others at the end of the meeting, let's uh, remember to announce our October meeting topic. And also a reminder for everybody to attend the October 2nd uh, uh, rallies. Rally in March. In their, in March in their hometown. And if you're in Washington, DC, uh, please join us at 11 a.m. on Saturday at um, uh, the Federal Center. Um, at the statue and judiciary uh, I'm sorry, in uh, Freedom Plaza, which is the only statue there. I don't know who it is, but it's a man on a horse. horse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At 11 yeah. a.m. And then the march would go up to the Supreme Court. Right. Okay, are you, I'm going to then say a few words. I'm Connie Cordovia, and I'm co-president with Sue. Um, my job is to make sure that everybody is timed to their 15 minutes that they were promised because we want to be sure everyone has a question and answer time at the end. <clears throat> I am also going to be the hook, so to speak, because I'm keeping the timer. Oh, I said that. Okay. Um, let's see. I also would ask if people have questions, could you put them in the chat? We'll be monitoring the chat for the questions. Um, and so that way we don't, we can kind of get things lined up. And then if, once we answer everything that's in the chat, we Okay. All right, with that, okay. I'm turning it over to you. And okay, welcome, everybody. Um, we're going to learn from our great panel of experts about this once every 10 years realignment of legislative and congressional districts. Now that the 2020 census data has been shared, um, we will hear also that across the country, states are using a variety of ways to redraw their new maps. And um, there's been a lot of concern about those that methodology, as well as um, concern over the impact on minority and low income population of the redrawing and the most extreme would be deliberate gerrymandering of those populations. The um, lawsuits have been filed over the state legislations whose purpose it seems is to inhibit and restrict voting rights. We'll hear about some of those lawsuits. Our four speakers are Gerardo, Bill Dostecki, um, Demetrius Fisher, Tony Michelle Travis, and Joseph Posamato. And they will discuss the process, gerrymandering, the impact on minorities, women, and the economically poor populations, and the challenges to state voting re restriction laws. So we, we are going to start with Gerardo. Gerardo is from the William J. Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law. He is an advisor on their voting rights and elections program. He is a Yale Law School graduate and was editor in chief of the Yale Law Journal. Currently a PhD candidate in philosophy at the University of California, Berkeley. And he has taught constitutional law, administrative law, and political philosophy to, for 12 years at Rutgers Law School and New York Law School. Gerardo, you may start. Oh, th thank you so much, Jeanette. And it's really a delight to be back uh, speaking to the Clearinghouse. I, I participated in an event that you did last year right. on the Electoral College. And uh, 
it occurs to me that uh, besides having this wonderful audience, um, again, one of the things that the two events have in common is their impeccable timing. Um, that event, uh, as you may recall, happened, I think, about a week or a little more than a week before uh, the first ballots were starting to be cast. Um, or, and this event is happening really right in the heart of redistricting season. Um, it was, I believe, August 12th when the Census Bureau released to the states the very fine grained block level, really corresponding almost to a city block level census data, which is what states use to draw uh, congressional and legislative districts. Um, and last night, I believe almost right on cue, Oregon finished its congressional districts. I believe the, gov the governor signed uh, the bill, uh, sort of making them the first state uh, to go through the process. So we're really in, in, the, in the thick of it right now. And that, that's wonderful timing for making this a, a lively discussion. I just want to point out, uh, partly because of my background and my interests, that there are a lot of dimensions to this topic, uh, philosophical, uh, historical, really having to do with constitutional theory and democratic theory that it would be lovely to talk about. Uh, but I've kind of tailored my remarks to the moment because I, I am aware that redistricting is very much a practical matter right now and that um, because COVID uh, delayed some of the processes, as I'll mention in a moment, uh, there's an especially tight turnaround uh, for the redistricting to happen in time for the 2022 election. So um, I'm going to try mostly to suppress some of my philosophical impulses, but I hope that uh, I can at least give a sense of what some of the difficulties are in that area uh, so that if you're inclined to pursue this issue at a calmer time, uh, you, you have a sense of where, where some of the um, interesting places to look uh, would be. So uh, I'm gonna try very much to tailor my remarks also to uh, my fellow panelists. I wanna try to give an overview of the redistricting issue that will uh, set up some of their remarks. And I, I thought I would divide my comments into three general parts. Um, I wanna say a little bit about what redistricting is uh, and how it works. Um, I want to say a bit about the problems with redistricting uh, and then quickly mention some uh, possible solutions or ways of addressing those problems. Uh, and then um, I look forward to the discussion that will we'll follow after that. So I, I know this is a, a highly informed audience. So um, I'll, I'll quickly just mention that redistricting is the third stage in a decennial process, as I think Jeanette mentioned earlier, uh, of, you might say, you know, if you take literally the metaphor of house in House of Representatives, uh, it's, it's a kind of 10 year renovation that we do uh, of that institution. And uh, if the legislative branch of, of our federal government is the branch that's supposed to be closest to the people, the House of Representatives is the sub branch that is the most close to the people. And to keep it that way, we have to go through this 10 year process to make sure that it, it really reflects the people that it's supposed to represent. Now that three year process, uh, or sorry, that, that 10 year process has three parts. And uh, quickly to mention them, the first is the census, which uh, ended, you know, uh, was conducted starting in April of last year. And that uh, raised a lot of interesting uh, issues. Um, there's, following the census, and uh, what I wanna say quickly about the census is that it's an actual count of the people in the United States where they live. Uh, the constitution requires an enumeration of the people, not just uh, a survey. That's why it's so important uh, for people to fill out their census forms because the government can't use statistical methods to estimate how many people really live there and then base redistricting on that it's required to be an actual count. So there's that, that very uh, elaborate counting process, which is the first stage. Once the census data is processed, uh, the next stage is called reapportionment. And the Census Bureau uses a very particular mathematical formula that um, I believe was, uh, the most recent one was enacted into law in 1941 to determine how many representatives in Congress each state is going to get. Um, that part is mostly mechanical. There's some uh, you know, formalities to enact it, but the Census Bureau does that, as I said, based on the mathematical formula. Um, this year, that 
process was completed around April um, and it produced some interesting changes. Um, some of the, the, the winners of the reapportionment this time around were Colorado, Florida, North Carolina, Oregon, and the big winner was Texas, which uh, gained two congressional seats. The rest of those states gained just one. Um, among the states that lost representation are some of the traditional populations, historically, you know, population centers of the country, places like uh, New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, and surprisingly, California, you know, um, joins those ranks. So those are those states are each losing um, a representative and the states I mentioned earlier are gaining them. Now, what the third stage that happens based on that data is redistricting. And as I mentioned earlier, it starts in August, or it started this year in August when the Census Bureau released really the, the fine grain data that then allows the states to draw maps. Um, and redistricting, unlike reapportionment, is not a mathematical process. It's very much a political process. Uh, the constitution as it's been interpreted requires that the districts be of roughly equal population, but the boundaries of those districts are not um, determined really by much in the way of constitutional constraint. Um, there is an important caveat there that uh, racial gerrymanders receive a particular kind of scrutiny, um, but gerrymanders based on partisan considerations um, have been held by the Supreme Court to be sort of outside the scope of their review. Um, so by and large, uh, redistricting is, is a process that's been left to the political branches and that's where some of the problems can arise. Um, in some states uh, like uh, California, Colorado, uh, states through their own legal mechanisms have set up independent commissions to draw the districts. Uh, California did that, I think about 10 years ago through a ballot initiative, uh, Prop 20. Um, and the, the point of those commissions is to have a, a, a balanced uh, group that is uh, somewhat insulated from electoral politics and that represents both political parties, uh, go ahead and draw the districts. And so that we don't have the problem of legislators trying to protect themselves and trying to advance their partisan interests. That's happened in a few states and there's a growing movement on that issue. I'll come back to it a little bit later, but the, the constitutional default really that's uh, set up by article one, section four of the constitution is for the state legislators uh, to, to do the redistricting themselves. Um, and that's where I think a lot of the, uh, the real drama around redistricting happens is in the states where the legislatures are, are doing it. Um, earlier, I mentioned Oregon, and that's a, a pretty interesting example because uh, they uh, redrew their districts recently in a way that, that creates uh, some competitive seats, but, but out of the six, five of them are expected to go to Democrats and maybe one uh, to a Republican. Um, and it's a state where Democrats control uh, many of the branches of the state government. But because Oregon has a very high uh, quorum requirement for their legislature to do business, the Republican minority was able to extract some concessions. Um, and that's um, not exactly the kind of balance that you ideally hope for in something like an independent commission, but it shows that where there is some, uh, you know, contestation in the state government, some division, uh, the political process can yield some kind of compromise. The, the problem, and this is gonna start going into the second part of my talk, is where uh, one party controls a state government very thoroughly, uh, and then there really is no impediment to their drawing the districts in such a way as to really entrench uh, partisan advantage. Um, and that's where we start getting into sort of the, I think the, the, the more difficult um, practical problem of redistricting. Um, I wanna to try to take two stabs at, at sort of stating what the problem is. Uh, it's tempting and it's sort of, uh, I think a little too easy to cast the problem in purely partisan terms, although I think that could be a good place to start to try to get a handle on it. Um, and I thought I would take a couple of examples from uh, Rucho versus Common Cause. That's the, the recent Supreme Court case that I alluded to earlier in which the Supreme Court said that partisan gerrymanders were not um, really a topic for judicial examination. 
In that case, they considered two uh, partisan gerrymanders, one in North Carolina, where uh, in the year 2016, Republicans won about 50% of the vote statewide, um, but they won 10 out of 13 House seats in North Carolina. Uh, that means they won about 77% of the representation, uh, despite winning only about 50% of the votes. Um, as a kind of partisan mirror image, in Maryland, uh, from the years 2012 to 2018, Democrats consistently won a majority, but never more than 65% of the vote. Um, but they, during this time, they held seven out of eight House seats, so for a representation of about 88%. Um, and one way to see this problem is that, that you know, just at a partisan level, um, the parties aren't being represented uh, in proportion to their share of the population. Um, but I said I wanted to take two stabs at the problem because it's not really just a problem for people who belong to one party or the other. There's a, a deeper problem there for democracy itself. And sometimes you'll hear people describe that problem by saying that um, the problem with gerrymandering with this kind of uh, heavily partisan redistricting is that it allows politicians to choose their voters rather than allowing voters to choose their politicians. Um, and that's a good slogan. And I think what it really means though, is that it makes the, the legislative body, in this case, I've been focusing on Congress, less responsive to the people and specifically less responsive to shifts in popular opinion. Um, as really any observer of American politics knows, so much depends on the, the, the median voter, um, that sort of uh, elusive mythical person who voted for Obama and then Trump say, you know, the, those people who really are, are persuadable in every election. And when you have redistrict, redistricting in the partisan fashion that I mentioned earlier, like in North Carolina or Maryland, the voices of those, those median voters are basically lost in the shuffle. They don't, they don't really make a difference. And so we're, 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 ceasing to have exactly what redistricting is supposed to accomplish, which is a legislature that is responsive to the people, that is uh, renovated, um, refreshed in a democratic way. So that's, that's in some ways the, the deeper problem. And then uh, compounding that is the problem that, that minority representation uh, can also uh, get suppressed during a redistricting process. Um, recently, uh, David Wasserman of the Cook Political Report uh, mentioned uh, in an article on the Atlantic Magazine, a really excellent um, piece on redistricting, that in the states of Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and South Carolina, uh, African-Americans are 28% of the voters, but they hold just 17% of the congressional seats. Um, and, you know, partisan issues aside, uh, partisan redistricting can lead to a situation where, where a minority group or another is, uh, is is silence relative to its share of the population. So um, the problem I there is something that I've sketched and I wanna say something briefly about the solutions, which I hope will uh, open up the discussion to some of the topics my, my colleagues will be discussing. I mentioned earlier what's not a solution for partisan gerrymandering, which is really the federal courts. Uh, the Supreme Court has said, this is basically a political question that has to be determined by the political branches. Um, and unless there's an issue of racial gerrymandering, they're not going to get involved. So what can be done? I will just quickly mention a couple of options. Um, independent commissions like the ones in California are an excellent way to go. The Brennan Center uh, has come out in support of them and has even drafted some model state legislation for what an independent commission could look like and how it can work. Um, those, however, take a lot of time to set up, and it may be too soon for the, it's getting a little late, I mean, for the 2022 elections. Um, there is a federal law called, or a bill called the Freedom to Vote Act, uh, sponsored by Senators Manchin and Klobuchar, um, which tries to limit the role of partisan motives in redistricting. Uh, that bill is uh, among many that's currently being uh, uh, talked about in Congress, and its fate is very much up in the air. Um, a interesting, I think, solution that I think deserves more attention, but is again, maybe a little too, too lengthy to achieve now would be uh, to increase the size of the House of Representatives. 
Um, and finally, there's the possibility of litigation in state courts. Um, and uh, we're lucky to have uh, Joseph here, uh, who I think can tell us a lot more about that option, because even though federal courts have remained outside the process, state uh, courts and state constitutions are very much in play um, as a way of uh, addressing some of the problems with redistricting. So uh, uh, thank you, uh, Connie, especially for the, uh, <laughs> the timekeeping. And I will now uh, hand that over uh, to my fellow panelists. Thank you. Jeanette, you have to unmute. You're not unmuted. You need to unmute. I'm doing it. Am I? Oh, there you okay, go. Got there we are. There got we it. Go. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. That was very informative. And uh, Oregon uh, finished today. The um, our next speaker is Demetrius Fisher, who is um, the national campaign manager for the People Powered Fair Maps campaign for the League of Women Voters. The, this People Powered Fair Maps is a national redistricting program focused on creating fair political maps nationwide in all 50 states plus DC. Mr. Fisher has led a pilot program in Ohio to increase voter registration and turnout in communities of color on an important ballot initiative. He has also served as a senior executive administrator for the chief operating officer at the CDC. So Demetrius began his career in grassroots organizing and nonprofit management with the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, where NAACP, where he has been involved in some capacity since 1996. Demetrius has dual Bachelor of Business Administration degrees in management and in general business, also a Master of Science degree in guidance and counseling, all from Fort Valley State University, located in Fort Valley, Georgia. Um, Demetrius, you're on now. Great, thank you so much, Jeanette, and good afternoon to each of you. Really excited to be um, a part of this panel um, and just to talk about um, the redistricting process and, and you know, ways that folks can really get involved in this important fight. Um, as Jerry alluded to earlier, you know, it is a lot going on with redistricting. Um, it is not a one size fit all for each state. Um, and, you know, being that the census data has already dropped, the threats around gerrymandering um, continues. And I won't say begin because I know that some folks, some states had already started to use the old data to kind of uh, begin the, the process for, um, for the redistricting process this time. So historically, you know, politicians have uh, manipulate the redistricting process to expand or protect their own power, even um, the determinant of minority political, political parties, you know, marginalized um, populations and often um, black communities and communities of color. Um, and this is what we call gerrymandering. Um, and there are two um, types of gerrymandering. One is racial gerrymandering um, and the other is um, political gerrymandering. So a racial gerrymandering um, is when um, map makers draw boundaries to either benefit or disenfranchise uh, members of a certain race. Um, and we've seen this happen, you know, um, as Jerry talked about early, earlier about um, the situation that took place in North Carolina, especially with North Carolina a and being split into two different districts um, in 2016. Um, and you know, political um, gerrymandering is when maps are drawn to increase or decrease the influence of a, of a uh, particular political party. Um, and Jerry also, I guess we were thinking the same um, because we have some of the similar uh, examples where he talked about Maryland um, elected Democrats as seven of the eight congressional seats. So that is kind of some examples of, you know, what the gerrymandering um, kind of looks like on the political and also on the racial landscape. 
Um, and with that, and we know that the fight was coming, um, um, redistricting is not a new process. It has been around for decades. Um, and we, you know, at the League of Women Voters really hone in to the issues that, you know, happened in the past. Um, and wanted to have a vehicle to really um, have a strategic approach to how we fight for fair maps. So in 2019, the league um, launched what we called our People Power Fair Maps program. Um, this is a program where we advocated for the creation of, of equitable, accurate maps in all 50 states plus DC, um, but to also educate folks around the redistricting process to ensure that we increase public engagement um, in this redistricting cycle that is currently um, that we're currently in. Um, the focus of um, our people power fair maps is we want we wanted a way to ensure equity and transparency um, in the map drawing process. We wanted to be able to um, have a way to advocate for the creation of independent redistricting commissions um, and also the integrity of commissions that already exist. Um, we are really pushing for the restoration of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, um, and we are going to continue to monitor um, and to protect the free and fair clause in state constitutions. Um, in addition to that, we are increasing our education and public engagement to ensure um, the community um, has a say in the community districting process. So with that, with any type of, you know, program of this magnitude, we wanted a real way to be able to, um, to measure our impact. Um, and how we've been able to do that is we wanted to do that in four different buckets. Um, we thought about our communication strategy and how we engage the general public um, in preparing them for testimony um, to be able to um, go to these um, hearings and also hope testimony parties of their own or really break down the information so folks can understand the legislative advocacy. What is in a lot of these bills? What does this redistricting process and cycle look um, and mean for all of our communities in which we live? Um, but also wanted to have a litigation strategy. How do we push back against challenges to gerrymandered maps? Um, so really working with um, the campaign legal center around this tool called plan score to really analyze and assess um, fair and equitable maps to make sure that these maps that are being submitted and proposed are not gerrymandered in any way. Um, but we also included a organizing component. How do we get out um, into the communities and make sure that folks are really participating in these hearings, they're submitting testimony, because we know that redistricting is not, or has not been the most sexiest topic that folks wanna really engage in. So really figuring out creative ways in terms of how we get the general public that are not as close to this work um, involved in this redistricting um, cycle. And with that being said, we know that we cannot do this work in silo. Um, it takes all of us collectively working together. Um, so what we, you know, was very intentional about is our partnerships. Who are we, who has been traditionally at the table and who's not? Um, and how do we um, get them engaged. So we joined what we call the Coalition Hub for Advancing Redistricting through grassroots engagement. Um, and this is a nine member national um, organization um, that is designed to create a space for groups like the League um, and the other eight organizations um, to organize people in states and local communities um, around the redistricting process. Although our organizations, you know, we all bring different skill sets, uh, we have presence in different states, um, oftentimes we deploy different strategies, but we're united around one common goal, and that's redistricting must be transformed to allow more voices to participate, to be heard, and ultimately to be represented. Um, so we are committed to empowering people to be very um, intentional uh, from being excluded from voting and at local electoral um, politics. Um, the nine member organizations that make up this uh, National Coalition Hope, uh, Hub is APIA Vote, the Center for Popular Democracy, Common Cause, Fair Count, the League of Women Voters, 
Lifa Malavota, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the National Congress of American Indians and State Voices. So we came together on a group of shared goals where we've created um, and anchored material and co-branded uh, so that we can reach communities that we have not traditionally worked with in the past to make sure that we create a safe space for folks that want to engage um, in the redistricting process. They have all of the tools that they need to be successful in this fight. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, there are some new laws that are coming down the pipeline. So, you know, we want to be intentional in our efforts at the state and federal levels to create fair and consistent redistricting process nationwide. Um, so this is just some of the legislative, legislative initiatives that the league supports. Of course, the Freedom to Vote Act, um, which will introduce transparency provisions such as requirement that community districting meetings be open to the general public, but also the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. This bill will both modernize the voting rights process um, and restore the Voting Rights Act of 1965, along with its protections against racially based voter discrimination. This will provide essential protections against you know, racial gerrymandering and make the voting and make voting more accessible to Americans. Because as you can see, there are so many attacks on voting rights um, and just on the voting rights process. So we wanna make sure that folks understand what these bills and what these acts look like um, and what they can do to push back um, if it is something that you know, doesn't sound right for them, that they will have all the information that they need to make a better informed decision. And with that, we are really, you know, as mentioned early on in the call, um, you know, today is National Voter Registration Day. So we're really out here in the streets and in the trenches, making sure that folks are getting registered to vote and not only getting registered to vote, but participating uh, in the um, voter process. Um, so there are several tools um, that are available and I'll be sharing some of that via the chat um, and really invite all of you to be involved in our Twitter Town Hall meeting um, that we're gonna have tomorrow uh, with Black Lives Matter um, and also Mifim La Volta and APIA Vote um, that will be moderated by um, our league president, Virginia K. Solomon. Um, and also on Thursday, um, we will have a Twitter town hall meeting, um, <clears throat> not Twitter town hall meeting, but a Facebook live meeting entitled Our Voice, Our, Voice, Our Communities um, Addressing Local Redistricting um, that will be moderated by um, our board president, Dr. Deborah Turner, um, with panelists from the NAACP um, and also from APIA votes in the National Congress of American Indians. So I will be dropping in the chat ways that folks can get involved in that um, and be happy to answer any questions during the question and answer period or if you have any questions um, about any information that we shared, you can drop it in the chat. And thank you so much. And I will kick it back over to our moderators. Thank you so much, Jeanette. Yes, thank you, Demetrius. Um, next, we're going to hear from Tony Michelle. Um, Tony Michelle C. Travis is a professor of political science at George Mason University. She has taught and conducted research on urban politics, racial and gender dimensions of elections and public policy issues. She has written numerous books and her latest is a co-authored book called Uneven Roads, and an introduction to US racial and ethnic politics. Professor Travis has served as a political analyst on C-SPAN, CNN, Fox Morning News, BBC, and NBC, ABC, and CBS affiliates. Her current research is on the mayoral administration of Walter E. Washington, the first elected mayor of Washington, D.C. in the 20th century. She was a fellow at the Rothermeer American Institute of Oxford University. I'm going to turn it over now to Tony. I think you need to unmute.
up in the le left right hand corner is it there you got it. now okay now you got it all right wanted to look at some of the issues in regard to voter suppression and in thinking about it gerrymandering is the old method that was always used but it was not done in public view so very few people paid attention to how it was being done and redistricting was done by the majority party in the state house. So now redistricting in some states, as has been pointed out, is done by commission. And now we even have computer models that are used to draw new lines based on redistricting criteria of whether or not the district is compact, equal population, racial features, and the other issues when you're supposed to be drawing it fairly. So we have a situation say where those of you who might know about Virginia under the bird machine years ago, which controlled the entire state, the poll tax was used to suppress the vote of not only blacks, but of all poor residents. However, today Virginia's changed and now provides options for early voting, curb service for those who need assistance and absentee voting. But the new tactics, and we need to note that under federalism, the tactics of voter suppression will differ on a state by state basis. So something like 18 states have written new laws, uh, mostly to make it inconvenient and difficult to vote. I found a list of at least 61 ways that are now being used to suppress the vote on this. Uh, no Sunday early voting, fewer polling places, failure to accept tribal IDs, employers not giving time off to vote, proof of citizenship. So possible responses to this. Voters need to be organized similar to the days I would say of machine politics. If anyone is familiar with Chicago and perhaps Boston where every known registered voter must have a way to get to the polls on election day. This usually means older voters and especially African-American women who are the most powerful voting bloc in the Democratic Party. Uh, the big change I think has been, as has been pointed out by our last speaker, the organizations, new organizations and coalitions Black women are now organized. Stacey Abrams with Fair Fight with a single focus on voting. Letitia Brown, Black Voters Matter Fund. So we must expand those types of organizations outside the South and it must keep pressure on state governments. And as has been pointed out, we must educate our voters across the US. As more interest groups form, they must go state by state to fight the specific forms of oppression unless we can get the federal legislation, which would solve some of these problems. And uh, that is far from being assured that we can get federal legislation. Possible remedies, automatic voter registration. European countries do this much better than we do. They've even got a system for registering male student, uh, males at birth for military service in some countries. Voting day could be a federal holiday. We could ban, as, as has been pointed out, partisan gerrymandering. We'd still have to fight racial gerrymandering. So I'll leave it at that, turn it over to the next speaker. Okay, thank you, Tony. Our next speaker is uh, Joseph 
Posimoto, who is an associate in the Elias Law Group, recently formed by Mark Elias, a well-known speaker for election rights. Joseph was an associate in the Perkins Coie uh, law firm and active in their political law group. Mr. Posimato's practices include areas of constitutional challenges to restrictions on voting rights, and um, he is currently involved in several state cases. Joe has a law degree with honors from Harvard Law School. He, is, he was an invitational member of the Harvard Supreme Court Litigation Clinic and a graduate of Fordham University. He has clerked for the Honorable Joseph Droney, U.S. Court of Appeals of the Second Circuit, and also clerked for the Honorable Catherine Blake, U.S. District Court for Maryland. Joseph. Thank you, Jeanette. And thank you to the rest of the Clearinghouse for uh, inviting me to speak today and uh, join these excellent other uh, speakers. Um, so I just want to echo, I think, a theme that many of the speakers who have come before me have, have hit on, which is that we are currently facing across the country a tidal wave of new voting rights restrictions. And a lot of attention has been given to laws that are directly uh, suppressing or restricting the right to vote uh, in elections. And um, not so much attention has been given to redistricting and how similar forces are at work to try to prevent particularly minority uh, and to be more particular Black and Latino voters from gaining access to the polls and electing candidates of their choice. Um, and I think the appetite for these sorts of laws and restrictions is only going to grow as um, demographics across the country change and as minority voters play a large and larger role in um, elections across the country. Um, so, you know, broadly speaking, um, I and the rest of the Alliance Group are, are involved in litigation on voting rights issues directly across the country, but we are now gearing up for a significant fight on redistricting across the country. Um, and I just want to say at the outset that you know we are currently involved in litigation and we are preparing for litigation. Uh, so there's only so much I can talk about, and that uh, my views here are my own and not don't represent the firm or the views of our clients um, necessarily. Um, but you know, I thought I would talk first about some of the causes of action that uh, we generally bring, and many of these across claims, uh, sorry, cross um, voting rights issues. So some will be brought uh, in direct voting rights restrictions, and then those same claims will be brought uh, to challenge uh, maps that legislators uh, and their governors adopt. Um, and then uh, just speak a little broadly about uh, some of the cases that we've currently filed, um, and then uh, wrap up quickly so we can leave some time for questions. Um, but first, so the primary law that we use um, outside the Constitution for challenging these sorts of restrictions and, um, and these maps is just Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which prevents uh, legislators um, in the voting context uh, from denying the right to vote um, on the basis of race or on the basis of a language minority. And in the redistricting context, it, um, it uh, bars the legislatures from passing maps that dilute the vote for certain racial minorities. Um, in the first context, it's sort of easy to understand what the Voting Rights Act does. If a law has the effect um, of denying the right to vote for, uh, on the, on, for a racial minority, then you have the beginnings of a claim. The Supreme Court's recent decision in Brnovich uh, last term has made those sorts of claims more difficult uh, to bring. Um, it is still the case that you don't need intent so the legislature doesn't need to intend to racially discriminate in their voting rights laws to bring one of these claims, but you do need to show more than just a modest burden on a minority group's ability to vote in order to succeed on these claims going forward. Um, in the redistricting context, what it means to dilute the vote is not really intuitive, um, but essentially what it means is that um, a legislator is legislature is barred from creating a map with legislative districts that either pack minority voters in one district or um, 
split, and there's a technical term for this called cracking districts in which minority voters uh, were otherwise the majority uh, to split them up into minority districts. Um, so the reason a legislature might pack um, the minorities in one district is so that their influence is limited to that one district. Um, say you, you know, uh, I'm just going to pick a state at random, uh, Alabama has a significant Black population, and the state can curb the influence of that Black population by packing those Black voters in one district, which means that they have the power to elect one candidate of their choice, but no more than one despite the fact that they may have uh, su substantial numbers or enough numbers to elect more than one candidate of their choice. And in that circumstance, um, section two provides a remedy, uh, which means, uh, which allows litigators like me and others um, uh, to challenge those maps as diluting the right um, of those minor voters to, to vote. Um, so we see these sorts of things across the country, and um, we expect many of the maps that are ultimately passed to include these features of packing and cracking um, districts uh, in certain state maps. Um, you'll note that most of what I've said so far is uh, turned on race, and as Jerry had mentioned, um, the Supreme Court has largely destroyed any uh, partisan gerrymandering claims um, in federal courts, at least. Um, and so broadly speaking, uh, in federal court at least, and when it comes to federal remedies and federal causes of action, we are limited to race-based um, gerrymandering, um, and race is the predominant factor at play in voting restrictions as well outside of their district context. Um, that is not to say that there, it is impossible to bring partisan gerrymandering claims. Uh, as Jerry also mentioned, state law uh, comes into play in, um, in those contexts. Um, and not every state has um, an avenue to bring those sorts of claims, but one in particular is Florida, uh, which in 2010 passed what's called the Fair Districts Amendment, um, which is a, a popular amendment that the citizens of Florida had passed um, after being fed up with the state's partisan gerrymandering, which one uh, codifies um, many aspects of the voting right, the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, so prevents the sort of racial um, discrimination that I had just spoke about. But in addition to that, bans partisan and incumbent um, preferences in, in drawing districts. So in, uh, specifically, it bars intentional um, favoring of partisan, um, so particular part political parties or incumbents uh, when drawing maps. Um, this uh, amendment came into play after the 2010 cycle, when the Florida Supreme Court first had to um, grapple with it, and litigators were able to use it to challenge the Florida's map, and it uh, sort of sowed disaster for the Florida legislature's um, preferred map. Um, over the course of several different cases, which took, unfortunately, years and years and years to resolve, uh, the Florida Supreme Court, as well as other courts, just found found that the state's map had was sort of irredeemably um, showed a preference for um, Republican um, uh, Republicans in across the state, um, particularly in the Senate map that had passed the state version of the map. Um, which I should just uh, caveat and say that the redistricting is often talked about broadly, but it encompasses usually three different maps. One's the congressional map which is just the federal um, map that will be used to elect federal candidates. But it also includes state maps, and there'll be a state house map to elect the state house representatives, as well as state senate map to elect the state senate representatives. And all three maps are up uh, for grabs when uh, during these cycles. And e even though one map might be fine, there might be problems with a totally different map. Um, so in, in that case, the Senate map was um, uh, particularly uh, flawed underneath the Fair District Amendment. Um, so, you know, we look to state laws like that to help bolster our claims. Um, and then I think, you know, in addition to this, it just helps to talk about some strategy. So, um, and I think the state federal dichotomy is a good jumping off point. So when, when we look at maps like this from a litigation perspective, um, we have to decide where we want to bring the case, and often that um, is a function of one, how favorable we think the bench is or um, to certain claims, and then two, what sorts of claims we can bring in that court. Um, 
So those are important considerations. And then two, just um, in addition to those, uh, how quickly we think these, uh, these claims can be resolved. Litigating these maps is an imperfect way to remedy any constitutional or statutory violations because litigation takes too long and elections happen on a set deadline. Um, and this is a particular issue in this most in this upcoming redistricting cycle because the census data was so delayed that many state legislators are running up against deadlines. Uh, and the first deadline that they're running up against is the candidate um, filing deadline. So states will have a deadline by which candidates who want to run for office in those states need to file um, to run in a certain district. But the maps and the new maps aren't in place, then the candidates can't file. They can't register for a particular district to run in. Um, different states have different deadlines. In Alabama, that deadline is in January. Um, and so we expect the legislature to move very quickly in uh, adopting a map. But it also means that litigation um, has to move very quickly in order to make sure that a suitable map is in place in time for these sorts of elections. Um, so there are a ton of challenges involved in these sorts of claims, and it'd be, I think, way better and uh, despite, um, you know, this being our bread and butter, way better for this litigation not to exist and for just Congress and other state legislatures to pass laws that prevent these sorts of things in the first place and not, um, not create the need for litigation at all. Um, so that's uh, just a broad overview of the sorts of claims you bring and the sort of factors we think about um, when addressing these issues and um, I have to talk about this in any more detail. Um, but I'll leave it at that and leave some room for questions. Jeanette, unmute. There. There I am. OK. Um, I'm just sending a question myself. Hang on. Um, thank you, Joe. The um, You all are going to be busy. It seems like all the states are um, really getting on the bandwagon for um, using these legislation um, models that seem to be proliferating. I, I wanted to mention the uh, 1965 Voting Rights um, Act. You, you, um, many of you called for the restoration of it. Section 5 used to be when I was in justice, this was our um, way to make sure that certain states who have a history of diminishing the rights of, um, it started with the uh, rights of newly um, um, released slaves to have the rights to vote as well as other rights. Well, because of Shelby County versus Holder, the which was the section that was used um, by the Justice Department it required Justice Department approval of any changes of um, voting in these certain states. Justice Roberts in Shelby County versus Holder said it was no longer needed because voting has uh, not been inhibited in these states. And the reason why I wanted to point it out, because my hero, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, wrote a dissent that has this great line in which she said, taking away Section 5 of the 1965 Voting Rights Act is like in a downpour removing an umbrella because you are dry. This was RBG clever way of um, pointing out how harmful it is to remove section five. Uh, Connie, you, you're the keeper of questions that have come up and I'll turn it back to you. On mute, there we go. Uh, all right, there's a couple questions, but I think they've come from you primarily, but let me ask them to begin, and then I'm sure there will be others who have questions. Every one of the speakers, um, we would like to know, is the Electoral College outdated? And if you think it is, how could we deal with it in short of a constitutional amendment? Who wants to take the first stab at that one? Uh-oh, all the lawyers are silent. This is bad. <laughs> uh, 
uh, well, I mean, one uh, part, part of the problem uh, with the electoral college system that we have uh, comes from the indeterminacy of the procedures for counting the votes that are laid out in the Electoral College Act, which is not a constitutional provision, but just a statute that was passed in the 1880s. Um, and a lot of the, um, when we look back now at January 6th, I, I spoke on a related topic in October, 2020, but looking back at January 6th, 2021, uh, a lot of the threat to our democracy came from the um, just unclarity of that law, which contains a lot of, um, strange dead ends and seemingly contradictory provisions, but most importantly, doesn't really clarify the, the extent of the authority that the vice president has uh, in counting the votes um, and doesn't really clarify what reasons um, somebody could have for getting for not counting a vote. Uh, that I think is probably the most urgent reform. Uh, it's a statutory one and not a constitutional one. Um, I hope that addresses the question, but I'm curious what, what the other. Yeah, what are the other would say. Um, I, I agree with uh, what Jerry has to say. I think when it comes to actually ridding the country of the Electoral College, I think that would uh, they need a constitutional amendment that would be less easy than um, resolving the statutory um, ambiguities and problems that Jerry had um, identified. Um, uh, as for whether or not we should get rid of it, I, I, I think it's a little bit outside my expertise. I have a personal view on it, but um, yeah, I, I'd let others speak. All right, pardon my I, in the back. I'd like to oh, go ahead. A question further on the um, uh, popular vote compact. Uh, could you update us on that and tell us whether or not you think that is still a viable solution? instead of going for uh, an amendment to the Constitution. Gerardo? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. I was going to um, mention that as well. I'm glad for the reminder. Um, and I, I, this also was something that came up in our talk last year. And, uh, you know, the Brennan Center has uh, supported this idea of, in case anybody um, is unfamiliar with it, um, it's a way of, of actually getting to the Electoral College itself uh, short of a constitutional amendment. Um, the answer I gave earlier really referred to the procedures we use for counting the electoral votes, which I, as I mentioned, are, I think are in need of shoring up. But the, the compact allows states uh, to agree among themselves to assign their electoral votes to the winner of the national popular vote. And so it's a kind of end run around the system that is given to us by the constitution where the states kind of agree basically to to use the electoral college as a kind of mechanism for the to create a national popular vote in effect. Um, I, I, I do think it's a good and promising idea. Um, I, I'm a little less sanguine about it this year than last because uh, the wave of voter suppression laws means that the states now depend on the other states to kind of um, act fairly when it comes to letting their people vote. And I think, you know, uh, a state, uh, you know, a blue state is going to be less sanguine about giving its electoral votes to a, a Republican winner if the national popular vote margin was was somehow shaped by voter, you know, suppressive voter laws. So I think we, you know, it's a it's a good solution, but it really has to be addressed in tandem with voting rights um, to make it to make the national popular vote meaningful. Uh, and so, uh, given what's happened in the last, you know, almost year. Um, I think it's a good idea, the compact, but I think it really needs voting rights legislation to supplement it. Thank you, Gerardo. Um, uh, next time I want to ask uh, for Joe in particular, have there been any successful negotiated settlements in the state litigation lawsuits? Um, I think Tony wanted to talk about that other question. Did Tony? Yes, I, I did want to make a comment. Before we uh, briefly, uh, if we get rid of the electoral college, one needs to then think about which states are increasing in population and which are losing population. And the states which are increasing in population have the newer immigrants, and that will be a, a an issue that'll come up again. 
Thank you. That's absolutely true. And I wanted to um, say and make an additional comment. I've always been curious about the founding fathers, if you will. Um, no mothers, of course. Um, <laughs> the, the reason for the Electoral College, and I have a sense that that Joe can explain it, but he didn't really want to go there. Um, <laughs> and uh, it has something to do with maybe the difference, be, you know, the, the fact that we're bicameral, that we're that we have a Senate as well as a Congress. Um, Joe, I don't want to pull you into a conversation if you don't want to have it, but I'd love to hear something that you're comfortable with saying. And, and I may be totally off. Well, Jen, are you getting at the um, are you getting at the fact that uh, originally the Senate exists because the founders wanted to insulate parts of the legislature from the popular vote? I don't know if that's what you have in mind. Is that what the um... well? Yeah. So right, it sort of depends on who you ask. But uh, I think originally conceived, the Senate was not. Um, Popularly elected, and I, I believe senators were appointed by their governors of the state. Um, and the idea there um, was that uh, the founders wanted some check on popular will, and so wanted to distribute the ability to vote and the members of our um, legislature between the people and um, people that the founders thought were elite or more educated and better capable of selecting people for those powerful roles. Um, the Electoral College has like a, a similar ancestry in which um, we want to insulate the presidency from the direct popular vote. Um, it also gives more power to, um, it ends up distributing power on, so it, instead of allowing very populous parts of the country from um, overwhelming the votes from the rest of the country and selecting um, candidates, um, for presidency, uh, it would distribute some of that power to um, the smaller states by creating this electoral college system. Um, uh, but again, I'm not a historian in this area, and you know, I, I hesitate to say too much. And Jerry might have more to say on it um, as a scholar, as a scholar in residence here. Okay, uh, Demetrius, I understand that you got cut off somehow and left us, but you're back. And the question that we're discussing right now is, is the Electoral College outdated? And if you think it is, how can we deal with it in short of a constitutional amendment, which we, I guess, are trying to avoid? Um, so I agree with the other, you know, panelists. I'm very hesitant and kind of indifferent in terms of how, you know, what the response would look like for that. Um, but I, I do think um, before we can address any of this, we got to deal with some of these um, voter suppression um, pieces that are coming up to, to get us to a real path forward to really uh, make some real progress. So I think until we can are able to deal with some of these voter suppression laws and some of the pushbacks against, um, you know, voting rights and that sort of thing, I don't think we can come up with a full resolve at this particular moment. Okay. Um, now, the next question is, was the 2020 census an accurate measure of the U.S. population? It seemed there were many problems with data manipulation and restricting the reporting of immigrant and minority populations. How do you, how did our speakers feel about that one? Um, oh. I, I just, I can, um, yeah. you know, I think there, I guess with any count, and I think there's always going to be um, some room for error. Um, and, you know, just to be honest, just from a personal standpoint, I don't think, I think there's still a lot of undercounted communities that may not necessarily be represented. I think what has happened is we've done the best that we could based on the situation that we found ourselves in with the whole pandemic and that sort of thing. So I think there's all, there's gonna be some room for error. And I think we're gonna see some of that come up as maps are being drawn um, and being considered. Um, I think, you know, on down the road, you know, and sooner than later, 
Um, there's going to be some litigation and some lawsuits and things around that very question. So right now, I'm, you know, I, I just know that there are going to be some issues and we just got to gear ourselves up for the fight um, and come up with ways in terms of how we're going to push back uh, against these challenges and what is the path forward. Um, I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I should say I'm not a, a st statistician or a quantitative political scientist, but um, one thing to keep an eye on is uh, the Census Bureau does, in addition to the census, uh, less well-known uh, project called the American Community Survey right. that is is more of a traditional survey. And they, they differences, as I kind of alluded to in, in the talk, um, the census is a count and the constitution requires an enumeration. So you really have to just see who responds and count them. Uh, when you do a, a survey like political scientists do, you can use statistical methods to guess how many people aren't responding and you can try to come up with a with another uh, you know, projection of what the population really is. So we'll be hearing more about the ACS and what data it reveals and what that may reveal about a possible undercount in the census. But, you know, the constitution kind of locks us in to use the census for apportionment and districting. So that's the, that's the, that's an issue. And um, that's why it's so, so important that people count. And that's why uh, there's all that that movement to get people to fill out their their census forms. From the litigator's perspective, I think that's exactly right. I mean, we are where we are now. Um, so the data is what it is, and we have to live with it. And if there's no going back. So, you know, um, you know, we we just got to get better going forward. Um, but you know, we don't think, at least from our perspective, there's nothing in the data that's so damning, you know, um, to bring meaningful challenges to these sorts of things. Okay, um, Joe, I started asking a question rudely interrupting our other speaker and I apologize, but have you have you had any successfully negotiated settlements in states with litigation lawsuits? So I was going to say in, in the context of redistricting, um, this is actually a really interesting issue and, and it reminded me of something I wanted to bring up um, in during during my little talk, which is that there is a there's an alternate type of redistricting litigation called impasse litigation in which this legislature and the governor fail to actually enact a map, either because they can't get to it in time or because there's a divided government and the governors of one party and the legislatures of another and they cannot agree on a map. In that case, um, there are situations in which the state government will just come to court and say, hey, we need help. We, we're not gonna get this done. And that is sort of a negotiated settlement of this redistricting issue where together with the court and input from the legislature and um, plaintiff parties, a map is drawn. Um, now that map still might be subject to challenges afterwards, but that is sort of a negotiated um, sort of pre-litigation uh, solution to these sorts of issues. There are other situations in which a, we litigators might bring a claim against a state because they believe an impasse is likely, um, even if the legislature hasn't come to the table yet. In, in those situations, if a court, and they, it has happened, if a court rules in favor of the plaintiffs, the court will draw its own map. Um, and again, it's not quite a settlement in the way you're thinking of it, but it is outside the hands of the political parties at that point. And there'll be input by all parties involved, but the court ultimately makes the decision what the map looks like. Are there any other questions? I would just add in terms of redistricting wins. I think I know that the League of Women Voters, uh, our um, legal department filed um, a prison gerrymander in case in Virginia. Um, we were able to win that um, um, last week. So, you know, just really excited yeah. about that. And what that case was about was where the inmates would be counted, whether they would be counted um, in Virginia or whether it will be counted, you know, from their place of residence, because we know that people, you know, when you're in prison, you're coming from um, from different from different places. So that was a good win for us. Excellent. Uh, I have a question about the federal legislation. One of the problems, of course, uh, that we've become more aware of later on is um, the state legislatures. Uh, interfering with the fair 
accounting and recording of the votes. And I was wondering if um, someone could uh, uh, go through the federal um, voting rights legislation and let us know which of them um, includes provisions to stop that. So I'll say that the, 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 the name, the formal name of the bill now escapes me, but it's, it's the alternative to the, not the alternative, but the accompanying bill to the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act, um, ha which I don't think quite gets at uh, your concern, Sue, but does provide a number of provisions that protect the right to vote by mail, to prevent um, sort of restrictions on how those votes are counted. Um, uh, among other things. So I, I, of, of the two, I think that one is probably more likely to do the thing you're talking about. Um, as I understand, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act is more geared to reviving the Section 5, the now more than Section 5 of, of uh, the Voting Rights Act, which was struck down, as Jeanette had mentioned, in, in Shelby County, um, and recreating um, a sort of covered list of states based on new data, uh, new data about voter suppression in those states. And I think the For the People Act. Um, That's right, For the People Act. Yeah, um, also relies a lot on restoring mail votes uh, because there are so many states now who are putting such severe restrictions on mail ballots when in the past they've been the real lifeline for voters. So it's hard. Uh, let's see, Jan Erickson had a question. Um, how about, do we have any comments, ladies and gentlemen, on the Texas redistricted map? I'll just say this is likely going to be an area for litigation um, for the Elias Law Group, so I, I can't comment, but I, I'll leave it to others. <laughs> Somehow I knew that was going to be Joe's answer. <laughs> yeah, and I, um, and I think, uh, well, I, I, um, I'm less uh, up, to, up to speed on the process. Texas, as I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about apportionment, is the state that has gained the most representation in Congress. It's gaining two seats. Um, but the little that I've read, and I, I wonder maybe even somebody in the membership um, is closer to it. Uh, I think Texas will have 38 uh, representatives. And, and the likely scenarios seem to indicate that something like a 25 to 13 uh, split between Republicans and Democrats um, from a current, I think, 23-13. Um, I'd like uh, to have those numbers confirmed. But in any case, I think Texas is a case where the, um, the partisan split is close enough that it's actually, it, it can be very hard to gerrymander sometimes if, if there are enough people in the minority because they have to go somewhere. Um, and I think there, you know, in Texas, the uh, I, again, I, I um, would like to defer to somebody with more uh, on the ground uh, knowledge of that state, but um, it's, it looks likely that um, the partisan divide won't be that much more dramatic than it currently is. Um, again, um, invite anyone else to supplement my, uh, my read on the Texas situation. Okay. Well, uh, I think as time to recognize the speakers and how much we have learned from them, I'm um, really impressed with how complex and opaque some of these issues are. And we've really shined a light on, on some of the ways to approach this in an orderly way so we can understand them participate as citizens and um, start riding the ship, as they say. Thank you so very much, uh, Jerry, Demetrius, Tony, and Joe. Um, I think we've had a, um, a course. I feel like I should get uh, some kind of certificate after this. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks a lot. You, you're all great. I think we should have another seminar is what I think I can <laughs> surface here. Before, uh, we but close, 
Uh, Connie, could you uh, tell people about uh, the October meeting? Right. Um, the October meeting, we're going to be discussing the, the plight of women in Afghanistan and what can be done to help them both here and over there. Uh, Megan Carrado, our Vice President of International Affairs, has worked for years with Afghan women. Um, and um, we are arranging speakers for October 26th from 12 to 1.30. And we hope to be able to provide you with some information. The news today wasn't good about the 200 women judges who are hiding in fear of their life. So we hope that things will calm down. But I think unless we get people safely out of there, it's not possible. And I also want to remind people today is International Abortion Day. And because we are marching next Saturday on the restrictive law in Texas, we should start thinking about what happens in other countries and bring some of that back home here to the U.S. as well. So does anybody have any other comments or questions? Okay. Well, or announcements of meetings or other things? Pardon? I just want to say I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and learn and share with each of you today. Um, so keep the league in mind for future um, yes. engagement. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we do have a Twitter town hall tomorrow, uh, moderated by President uh, Virginia K. Solomon and also a Facebook Live, um, our communities, our voice, uh, Facebook Live event on Thursday. So feel free to drop in if you have some availability and we appreciate um, being here today. I have already registered. I want you to know that. Great. <laughs> Who does things <laughs> in the background. Also, Demetrius, I knew I recognized your name. You were with the NAACP for some time. And yes. I remember, so, yeah. Yes. Okay. I, uh, I just want to say thank you to I echo Demetrius. Um, thank you so much to Jeanette and the rest of the clearing house for, for inviting me to speak. And it was, uh, it was really enjoyable. And I was glad to be here with, uh, with my co speakers. My yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank thank you as well. It's a uh, it's a pleasure uh, engaging with this group. It's such a uh, wonderful membership, and you have the, uh, the ability to to put together such a nice panel too. And I, I I'm grateful for that. Okay. I see your mouth moving, but you you must you have to unmute. I I was just going to say thank you for bringing us all together. We can always learn from these meetings and it's really important. It's a really important topic. Thank you. Okay. And thank I... you particularly for Jeanette and Alada for arranging for this meeting. Thank you, Sue. So what we'll be doing is we'll be uh, writing a summary of the meeting for our next newsletter and we'll uh, share the draft of the summary with the meeting uh, speakers so that they can correct any errors or add any uh, new information that they'd like to the summary. So thank you all. all right. Great. Have a good rest of the day, everybody. Yep, have a good thank afternoon. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.